Okay, so I think that seems to be a large majority of people. I'm still going to admit some people as they come in, um, but we'll get started. Uh, first, just a couple Zoom kind of protocols. I'm sure everyone's used to this now. Um, many of you, I, I think, have att attended some of our webinars in the past, so kind of know the how we run things. Um, I'm going to ask everyone to stay muted for the entire uh, webinar, um, at least while Dave is speaking. And we will have a chance to ask questions at the end. So his presentation runs about 45 minutes um, and we'll have 15 to 30 minutes of questions, depending on how many people have questions. The easiest way to do questions is to just type in the chat. Um, you can find that kind of at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat option. Um, if you'd like to test it out, you can quickly type in the chat where you're tuning in from um, and how much snow you got maybe um, in our last uh, lovely snowstorm. And I will read the chat questions at the end of the uh, webinar. So that tends to be the easiest way to work. If you've got a burning desire to ask Dave your question directly, I'll just ask you to unmute. Um, and you can just raise your hand or type in the chat or wave your arms around um, and I will call on you, ask you to un unmute and you can ask your question, but it tends to be a, a bit easier if you just ask it in chat. Um, and so with that, uh, oh, and you can keep your videos on if you'd like, you can turn them off, your choice. Um, with that, I'm I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Uh, Dave is an Algonquin Park naturalist. Um, he can fill you in a little bit more on what he does and probably will. And we've had the pleasure of having Dave run one or uh, be a guest speaker at one of our webinars already. He did a snapping turtle webinar last year, which you can find on our uh, YouTube channel. But, and uh, we'll be sending this link out at the end of the webinar as well. So thanks again, Dave, for coming for the second time, and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome, Aaron, and thank you very much for having me again. So I must have did a decent job the first time. Can everybody hear me okay? Put, put your hand up if, uh, if you can. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to share my screen, and we figured this out earlier. And... We'll make sure that we do it again. <laughs> All right, uh, Aaron, can uh, can you see my uh, initial slide screen? Yep, that's good. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, thanks again for having me today. My presentation is called "A Winter Walk in the Woods," and really, the idea behind it was skipping winter. And I want to share uh, some of the really fascinating ways that wildlife. Uh, prepares and spends the prepares for the winter and how they spend it, um, it which I thought was a really interesting topic for uh, for presentation. So hopefully you guys enjoy. So my name is David and I'm the chief park naturalist in Algonquin Provincial Park. I love nature and I love sharing it with people. So I feel like I've got the perfect job. Um, Usually, I like the stuff that happens in the summertime way more than the stuff that happens in the wintertime. Uh, but, you know, winter lasts a long time in our area, in Muskoka and Algonquin Park. So I should really try to lean into it and try to enjoy it, learn, learn a little bit more about it. So in our area, I think the time of year that, that we really enjoy is, you know, summertime. So we can get out into the backcountry. We can go camping, hiking bird watching, swimming, canoeing, all that great stuff. Uh, we really do live in a spectacular area. It's loaded with rocks and lakes and trees. Uh, some of my favorite places uh, are places that look like this. This is on McCraney Lake in Algonquin Park. And uh, we're pretty fortunate that we've got four really amazing diverse seasons to enjoy in our area. So whether it's spring wildflowers, like these beautiful trout lilies, uh, whether it's um, beautiful summertime scenes like this, a pond uh, near Rain Lake, Algonquin Park. So it's beautiful, it's warm, it's sunny. Uh, the smell of those sedges are in the air, the squish of the moss be between your feet or under your feet. It's really, really pretty spectacular. And as the seasons progress, we get a season like this. So fall colors, uh, which, you know, we just finished up here um, a couple months back. It was a really beautiful showing this year. 
And then what happens after that is a season like this. A long, quiet winter. The, the sound everywhere is dampened by the snow on the, on the trees. Um, the silence can almost be deafening. It's, it's really quite astounding how quiet it can be. Uh, we often don't really appreciate this season. Uh, it's long, it's cold. Uh, you know, we've got to do extra chores like shoveling the driveway or snow blowing, things like that. The winter driving can be pretty bad, uh, as was evidenced yesterday. Um, I definitely slid on the highway a little bit on my way home from work. So it's maybe not our favorite time of year. It is certainly going to snow. We have snow on the ground for six or seven of the months, not necessarily six or seven continuous months, but on, on all those calendar months uh, from November till even May, uh, there can be snow on the ground. The days become really short. There can be over a meter of snow on the ground. I took this photo of myself in some waist deep snow off a trail a few years back, um, which can certainly make getting around difficult. The temperatures can be cold. And uh, we recently had a really nice cold snap here. Um, it was about minus 30. Uh, we've had days in Algonquin Park in our area, uh, Muskoka, as low as minus 40 overnight. Uh, it usually warms up a little bit during the day, but it can be plenty cold. And even where we live in our part of Ontario, um, so uh, this is like a vegetation um, zone map for, for Ontario. So currently I'm in Huntsville, which is in zone E, which is similar to parts of Manitoulin, Sudbury, North Bay, and it sort of hooks around in this loop. And then the area uh, in F, uh, which is where Algonquin Park is, there's actually a really nice defined line where the climate is certainly different in those Algonquin Highlands. So it's certainly a little bit cooler, a little bit to the to the west or east of us rather. Uh, and it's much more similar to uh, the climate of, let's say, um, Temiskaming area or Algoma region, as opposed to um, like that Peterborough uh, type area. So uh, we live in a really interesting place in Ontario um, and uh, the climate could be fairly different from when I leave my house in the morning to when I get to the office in Algonquin Park. So from Huntsville to, to Algonquin, the temperature can sometimes drop as much as 10 degrees on the way to work uh, when I would think that it'd be warming up, but it doesn't. Uh, and the snow conditions and weather conditions can often be quite different too. So I know during COVID, we've, you know, maybe turned to the outdoors a little bit more than we had before. Oh, well, and it's probably, probably for many of you, uh, sort of a, a nice place to visit. Um, I've been trying to get out, make the most of winter by going for walks and looking forward to doing some skiing and a little bit more snowshoeing now that we've got uh, some snow depth. But while I was out there, uh, while I'm out there, I don't usually see too, too many animals, but it did get me thinking about what they're all up to. In the, in the COVID winter, like we're in right now, we're certainly feeling a little bit isolated. And I wanted to learn more about what my neighbors were up to. And, uh, you know, really, I miss my friends. I do like seeing wildlife whenever I go out. And even if I don't see them in wintertime, I do like to think about what they're up to. Winter is a pretty hard season for us and for wildlife. They face some really extraordinary challenges and they've come up with some amazing solutions. Hibernating is one of those ways, but it's not just as easy as finding a comfy place to sleep away the winter. So we're going to learn a little bit about how wildlife deals with winter. So I like to think about it as the three eighths of winter. So these are the ways that wildlife can deal with winter. There's uh, these rose-breasted grosbeaks. They migrate, they leave our area uh, for warmer climates with more abundant food. We've got uh, this spectacular mammalian predator, the marten in the center, uh, and they tolerate winter. They're active year round and they've got a nice warm fur coat. They've got a high metabolism uh, so they can be active year round. They certainly do need to eat a lot. And then we've got other creatures like this American toad, and we're going to find out some other animals um, that hibernate for the winter. So they're going to spend the winter in a state that is much different than their summertime state, and they're going to be doing some things that are much different than what they do in the summertime. So we're, that's the, the group of animals that we're going to focus on are the hibernators. But just to give you a last look at a real tolerator, I'll show you, show you guys this creature. 
that I took a video of on the side of the highway a few years back. So it was about minus 25 that day. You can see that it's snowing and the wind is blowing pretty hard um, as the, the sort of vertical snow that we can see going. Snow is piling up in his antlers and this hulking mammal, the moose, this bull moose, is having to eat a lot of food just to keep its metabolism high. Uh, so it needs to generate body heat and uh and energy just to survive and it's getting that all from eating twigs so a twig is technically a pretty low quality food so they have to eat a lot of it every day so this animal will end up eating you know 40 pounds of twigs a day which is a lot of twigs and that's why their poop looks like sawdust um at, at this time of year it's because they have to eat so much of that just to survive so instead of doing that we're going to skip the winter by hibernating. But why skip the winter? Well, for many species, there's not really a lot of food. If you eat insects, like uh, like many of our songbirds do, um, there's not really very many insects around, which is one of the you know many reasons why people like winter is there's no biting flies, for example. Maybe their body isn't well adapted for uh, traveling in the snow. So you could be... Um, the, let's say a toad imagine a toad hopping through really fluffy snow it's not going to work very well or what if you're a cold-blooded animal that can't generate your own body heat you might freeze solid and you might do so very quickly imagine uh putting a let's say bottle of water out on your deck when it was minus 30 it will freeze very very quickly so all these reasons uh, are good reasons why animals might hibernate for the winter and then how to, how to hibernate for the winter time. It's not just a long sleep. There's a lot of preparation on the animal's part, whether they know it or not. And in many cases, it occupies a big part of what they do and how they live their lives throughout the year. For cold-blooded animals, they typically have to find a safe place to hibernate and make sure that they don't freeze. Their metabolism slows right down, so they need very, very little energy. So if you can imagine um, when your... Uh, your thermostat for your home is set to, let's say, 25 degrees Celsius. You're using a lot of uh, fuel or, or gas or electricity just to heat your home. As you lower your home's thermostat, you're using less and less energy. For cold-blooded animals, let's say like snakes and frogs, their, their metabolism is dependent on the temperature that their body is at, and they do not produce their own temperature. So when it's warm out, their metabolism is high. And as it cools, their metabolism gets lower and lower. And for many of those animals, it's very important that they don't freeze or they could die. Uh, for mammals, in comparison, they need to put on a lot of fat ahead of hibernation to accumulate and store a lot of this energy. And then they will turn their metabolic thermostat down. So they'll lower their metabolism a bit as much as they can. And then uh, suppress some aspects of their metabolism as well. So throughout my presentation, I've got this little um, thermometer graphic. So the red uh, indicates like the summer body temperature of the animal. The blue is a comparison to the winter body, uh, the winter body temperature. And the dashed line uh, going behind the thermometer is the, uh, um, let's say the freezing mark. So bringing us back to summer, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite animals here. There's lots of animals that are out and about in the summertime that are amazing cold-blooded creatures, whether they're insects, whether they're fish that we can uh, go find in the lake, or we could maybe do that in the wintertime too. Um, my favorite are reptiles, and one of my favorite reptiles can be found in habitats like this. I know, I know snakes aren't everybody's favorite, but they're among my favorites. I like watching them. I like trying to learn more about them. We know a lot about how snakes live in the summertime uh, because even though they're hard to observe sometimes, they're much easier to study in the summertime. But we don't really know too, too much about what they do for the winter. And I'm really interested in what reptiles and amphibians in our area do in the wintertime. Uh, and it occupies about half of their year. So imagine spending half of your year um, where you could basically do nothing. So we don't normally see snakes in the wintertime. Every now and then I see some uh, like this one. I can't walk past a log with a lot of snow on it like, it, like this without uh, sort of 
molding a snake face on the front of it, sometimes putting a twig at the front end to, to look like a pork tongue. So this is a great way to, uh, you know, have a little bit of fun with some snow and imagine snow snakes in winter. But where do the real snakes go for the winter time? So snakes are reptiles, which means their body temperature is basically the same as their environment. At minus 10 degrees Celsius, a snake is frozen solid and dead. So to survive the winter, snakes must find a place that doesn't freeze. And a little bit of moisture, so a little bit of standing water um, is helpful uh, so they don't dry out. So as they breathe, they're losing a little bit of moisture just like we do. So if we fog up our glasses or a window or something like that, we're exhaling a little bit of water. Uh, they lose a little bit of water too as they breathe. So being in a humid environment can help sort of prevent some of that water loss. So where do they go? Well, for many species, the trick is to get below the frost line. And in our area, this is typically over one meter into the ground. And the trick is to not freeze or else they'll die. But to be, as, to be cold enough to maintain a very low metabolism to keep their energy needs very, very low. So the hard thing to do, it's a hard thing to do in our area as the ground can freeze to, you know, well over a depth, uh, a depth well over a meter. Uh, so in our area, snakes go underground, usually in deep rocky crevices. It could be rotted out tree roots. Uh, and some good temperatures for them to be at are roughly two to five degrees Celsius. So you have to get pretty low or deep into the ground to do that. And if there's a little bit of groundwater nearby, that's also handy so they can maybe drink a little bit. They can still move around a little bit at that temperature, but not very much and certainly not very fast. So what the snake is trying to do is sort of like what we are trying to do with our fridge. So we put food in the fridge, not because it prevents food from spoiling, but it prevents bacterial growth or mold and things like that. So a cooler temperature prevents um, the bacteria's metabolism from getting very, very hot. So the bac bacteria is on everything all the time anyway. Um, but if we keep it cool, it's not eating very much. It's not causing decay and spoilage of our food. So snakes, by going into a hibernaculum, a hibernation site that is at just the right temperature, is keeping their own metabolism low, but they're also not getting to a temperature where they freeze. And, and they'd be killed at, at a really low temperature. So um, a snake hibernaculum is usually uh, a crack or a hole in the ground. Uh, it could be an abandoned mammal burrow. Uh, it could be, you know, um, like a chipmunk burrow. It could be just cracks in the rock, rotted out tree roots. Uh, some people have even gone to building artificial hibernation sites for snakes on their properties. Uh, this would usually be something that could be, you know, over three meters deep. Uh, it'd be filled with like rock and cobble and concrete slabs and chunks of wood and things like that, covered over with sand, things like that. So um, it uh, it's certainly an impressive place. Some snakes hibernate in big groups, others hibernate individually. In our part of the world, uh, garter snakes will often hibernate nearby or, or together, uh, and they emerge all at once in the spring. So in comparison of body temperatures from the summer versus the winter, the garter snake is very, very low. So during the summertime, their body temperature could be, let's say, 25 degrees Celsius, and in the wintertime as low as maybe zero, two, three, four degrees. Very, very big contrast. Garter snakes are among the first snakes to become active in the spring. I always get excited to see uh, garter snakes first thing in the spring. I took this picture at Torrance Barrens a few years ago. Uh, where there was a garter snake that emerged while there was still a fair amount of snow on the ground. It wasn't a terribly warm day, but it was getting ready to speed its metabolism back up so it could start feeding again, hopefully finding a mate um, and getting on with, uh, with getting on with spring after what was a very long winter. So if you're like me, uh, maybe you like to spend a little bit of time camping. And if you're camping in the Algonquin Park area or Muskoka, there's a creature that is most assuredly on every single campsite, uh, and they're one of my favorites. They're a cute little creature, uh, and certainly pretty mischievous and very focused. The eastern chipmunk. <laughs> uh, every time I see a chipmunk, I can't help but laughing. I, I can't help but laugh. Their, uh, their antics are just great. So chipmunks are really good at preparing for the wintertime. 
uh, and they have to be. Like most squirrels, they're they're just a small type of squirrel. They don't pack on body fat, so they're they're not really able to store fat on their body very well. Um, but they do hibernate for the winter, unlike the other squirrels that we have in the area, like uh, red squirrels, uh, eastern gray squirrels, and flying squirrels. They do not hibernate, but the chipmunk does. So they do hibernate in a cozy, complex burrow, uh, complete with sleeping uh, sleeping quarters and even a toilet and an immense food store. So chipmunks throughout the active season stock up, and they are very curious little animals they're great at finding food and uh, sometimes they get very familiar with people and they'll uh, maybe ask or beg for food uh like this like this person is doing and they certainly shouldn't um a chipmunk collects many small hordes of food throughout the active season and in the late summer it combines this all into one huge horde um and you know like they will do some risky things like approach a person uh, they certainly gather up seeds, nuts, berries, mostly items that won't degrade uh, too much in the chipmunk's hoard. So putting something in like a like a piece of bread, uh, it might rot, get moldy or degrade, whereas like seeds and nuts and things like that, they'll stay good for a long period of time in the chipmunk's underground cache of food. So early on in the pandemic, uh, I think many of us uh, probably remember stocking up on food for what was uncertain times uh, and uh, not pictured here is all the toilet paper that everybody uh, also scrambled to get. Uh, but we do this too. So the, the chipmunk, it knows that winter is coming every year and it needs to go out and collect a lot of food. Uh, and, you know, I do this every year, whether it's um, canning food from the garden or storing food or making food in advance and then storing it in the freezer. Uh, storing food is, is pretty important. So, our chipmunks, they hibernate in their, their burrow, their complex burrow. Their body temperature drops to save energy, but because they don't have a lot of fat on their body, they periodically need to wake up and they go and they go to their food stores and they snack to replenish their energy. Uh, and they'll do this maybe uh, once a week, something like that. So they, they're not completely dormant, but their body temperature has dropped. Their heart rate uh, drops for a prolonged period of time to save energy. Uh, but because they don't layer up that fat, they do have to wake up sometime to go and eat. And uh, they certainly do that. Um, and fortunately, you know, an average chipmunk will store almost three years worth of, or three winters worth of food in one season. Uh, you know, most chipmunks don't live more than two seasons. So they usually store, you know, more food than they need, which is, you know, which is good planning. So a sure sign of spring is eventually on one of those warm wake up days where the chipmunk has gotten up to, to eat something. Uh, it does leave its burrow and uh, it goes and peeks its head outside to see what the world uh, looks like this spring. Uh, keep an eye for, keep an eye out for them underneath your bird feeder. That's usually one of the first places I see one is they wake up and they they want something fresh because you know we all know that we've sat there and looked at a fridge full of food and said oh there's nothing to eat um, and the chipmunk I'm sure does that too and says nah, maybe I'll go for some fresh seeds. I'm sure getting out for a stroll is nice after that long in the burrow. Now another rodent uh, that lives in our area and this isn't a very common one. Uh, and it's one of my favorites too, which is too bad. Um, it has all sorts of great names like groundhog, marmot, whistle pig. Uh, it's not really a common animal in our area. So I'm pretty happy to see one whenever I do get to see one, especially uh, if it's in the springtime, as long as it's not in my garden. So the way the groundhog or woodchuck um, spends the wintertime is, uh, you know, similar to the chipmunk, but a little bit different. It gets comfortable. It uh, you know, will build quite the nest or like the, the cozy sleeping area in its burrow. But unlike the chipmunk, it is able to put on a lot of fat. And it also produces an elaborate burrow with nest chambers, a toilet, but no hoard. It didn't store any food. Groundhogs eat mostly fresh vegetation that doesn't really store well. So imagine um, going to the grocery store and getting, you know, lots of head lettuce and something like that. And then, you know, trying to store it away in your bed. It's, it's going to get pretty gross pretty quick. So the groundhog puts on a lot of fat. 
The groundhog is a famous prognosticator of the weather with dubious accuracy. It is among the more famous hibernators and, you know, a very famous, uh, uh, very famous at waking up and looking for its shadow. Uh, they do go dormant for long periods. Their heart rates and body temperatures drop from near the 100 beats per minute to five beats per minute. So this is like a really drastic change in body physiology. Uh, their body temperatures are normally around 37 degrees Celsius, and they drop to as low as seven. But they can't do this all the time, so they periodically have to wake back up again. Uh, so over the course of a, uh, let's say, two-week period, that uh, the woodchuck's body will go from a deep sleep from, you know, about seven and a half degrees Celsius uh, for, you know, most of uh, about 10 days excuse me, and then warm back up again, its heart rate will, will um, speed back up, its body temperature will, uh, will increase. And then after a short period of time like that, it's going to go through whatever physiological um, functions it needs to. And then its body temperature and heart rate will drop right back down. And it's going to spend the winter doing that. Uh, and, you know, winter here can last quite a while. So uh, just, just like it's showing in this graph. So that groundhog that put on a lot of fat to help sustain itself over the winter time uh, is all well and good, but it because it does have to wake and warm itself and its metabolism is so low, it does have to wake up regularly um, and it doesn't use too, too much energy. So it seems like the groundhogs actually over fatten in the fall and they don't use all of that fat over the winter time. So they actually have a lot left over, which is really good news because when they emerge in the spring, there's very, very few green plants for them to eat. Uh, and their body weight keeps going down and down and down, even though it's really nice outside. So that, that groundhog that I showed uh, that emerged uh, first thing in the spring, um, it was just dead grass everywhere, which is a really low quality food. Uh, so its body condition is still, uh, it keeps declining until there's fresh new green vegetation for it to feed on. Hmm. So this is a nice misty morning in early fall in Algonquin Park. Um, and the water temperature is warmer than the air temperature on that particular day. And that's where we get this mist. Eventually, these waters are going to chill right down and it's, it's going to freeze over. I know many of you were on uh, the presentation they did about snapping turtles a while back. So this might be a little bit familiar to you. But uh, snapping turtles are probably my all-time favorite animal. They're just incredible. Occasionally, you might see a snapping turtle uh, in shallow water trying to get the last bit of warmth in the sun in, in early fall like this. But what do they do when the lake inevitably freezes over? And it's a long winter. So they spend the winter under the ice in the water, and they have to hold their breath. So you and I would not last very long in the icy water, uh, let alone uh, underneath the ice where we can't get surface to breathe. But these air breathing reptiles, they spend about six months trapped under the ice. Naturalists long thought that turtles uh, buried themselves deep in the mud at the bottom of the lake for the long winter. But more recently, scientists were able to follow the turtles to their overwintering, overwintering spots uh, using some pretty interesting technology. So we've got a turtle biologist here who followed a hibernating turtle to its hibernating location because it's got a small transmitter glued to the back of its shell. So the, the researcher was able to use uh, radio telemetry to uh, figure out exactly where this turtle was by playing a game of hot and cold following the signal that was being emitted by this, uh, um, this radio tracking device. And he got right to about that location and then he cut a small hole in the ice using an ice auger and then he's going to lower this camera down to actually see what the turtle is doing. And this, you know, the results were a surprise to people. So I know this image is a little bit grainy and kind of hard to see. But in the middle, we've got that sort of football shaped object right in the middle. That's actually a turtle shell. And then there's like the long with antenna coming off of the back of the turtle shell. So that's the, the turtle that they were doing the telemetry on. And it's just sitting right on the bottom of the creek. And this is a really important discovery because we thought that turtles would bury themselves in the mud. So they were hidden, uh, hidden from view. 
but because the turtles physiology it's actually important that they get a constant flow of fresh water over them they need some amount of oxygen to survive the winter they can't fully hold their breath for six months um, they manage to get a little bit of oxygen from the water so they're not breathing it in through their nose or mouth like we might uh, but they're actually taking a little bit in through what's called their cloaca which is you know a fancy word for the turtle's bum so they're taking in small amounts of water into their cloaca which i imagine is very cold the same temperature as the turtle and they're exchanging small amounts of gas so a little bit of carbon dioxide that we would normally breathe out but it's also found in their blood so they're exchanging a little bit of that carbon dioxide for a little bit of oxygen that, that's in that water so if they were trapped in uh, like let's say a pocket of mud like they had buried themselves they wouldn't be getting any new oxygenated water or very little oxygenated water there so they might eventually go hypoxic they might suffocate um, at a cellular level without getting that new oxygen from that flow of water um, that, that's that's going over them so the turtle is another one that its body temperature goes from maybe the 20s uh, during the summertime to down near basically zero in the winter time as long as there's liquid water the turtle's okay uh, because it's not going to freeze usually that water is about four degrees celsius for the winter time so they do survive by by exchanging those gases through their through their cloaca so i've got the little green arrow that's pointing to the turtle snout uh, and then I've got the sort of tan colored arrow pointing to the turtle's cloaca down here. Um, I can imagine that as the turtles emerge from hibernation, they're very excited to take those first breaths with their actual face and, you know, breathe with their lungs and all that stuff. Uh, there's some evidence that suggests that the turtles, when they wake up, um, their whole body is oxygen deprived because they weren't necessarily getting a whole lot through that gas exchange through their cloaca. Uh, so that they might be experiencing a full body cramp and maybe their their movements are fairly difficult i often come upon turtles like this uh, that have emerged from from the wetland to bask up on a, a bog mat for example to increase their metabolism so they can breathe faster uh, so they can maybe breathe off some of these uh, uh the lactic acid for example that's built up in their body Ooh. So I love scenes like this in the fall. This is a bunch of hoarfrost on uh, some alder and some other vegetation just on the side of the highway in Algonquin Park. So we've got a little bit of fall color here, the yellows and oranges, uh, and everything is covered in the final fall color, white. So as it starts to freeze, any uh, water vapor or water droplets that might be on the landscape, they also freeze. They turn to small ice crystals. A tiny droplet of water will expand as it freezes, which is unusual in nature. Most matter usually contracts as it freezes, but water is different. And if it happens to be in a container, it might explode. Everyone has probably done this at least once with maybe a bottle of water, a can of pop, or hopefully not a, a bottle of beer, but it happens. Imagine each cell in a body like, like this beer bottle. It's a little container, and it's filled with all the equipment that the cell needs to operate the body. Uh, so when all together, all of our cells make up our body. As water turns to ice, it will expand past the volume of the container. Remember that container is full. And those sharp ice crystals will puncture cell walls. Uh, so if you uh, periodically eat meat and you've got uh, meat that you've frozen and then you've thawed it out, there might be like a pinkish fluid that comes out of it. Uh, that cell fluid leaking out of that that frozen meat. So the water has uh exceeded the capacity of the cell and it's punctured it and then it's leaking out of that so most animals can't survive being frozen but this one can so wood frogs hibernate on the forest floor and it's not too too fussy about where it does hibernate unlike the snake and the turtle uh it doesn't choose a place that doesn't freeze the wood frog can actually freeze almost solid and come back to life it's got pretty amazing adaptations to be able to do this uh, which allow it to survive further north than any other frog in North America and beyond the Arctic Circle, which is really, really amazing. In our area, they're, they may have about six months of activity, but in the really far north, they might only be active for three months a year. Really, really spectacular. So to hibernate on the forest, the forest floor, the wood frog has a two-stage process. So first, 
Its organs secrete chemicals that allow the body to not freeze until colder than freezing. So th this is called supercooling. So its body will actually um, secrete some chemicals that will allow it to um, go well below freezing temperatures, but not having frozen yet. Then the water will leave some organs and glucose, a type of sugar, is secreted by the liver, which interrupts the bonds in water for preventing ice or from in water for preventing ice crystals from forming until well below that freezing temperature is met. The cells that do freeze do so in a really specific way. So basically from the least to most vital organs. So they're freezing from the uh, sort of outside inward. By reducing the amount of water in the cells and interrupting ice formation, the cells don't explode and typically no damage occurs to the frogs. Would, would frogs survive well at minus two to minus five under the snow and leaf litter? There's no brain activity at this point uh, in the frozen state and there's no heartbeat. And it, so it's truly incredible. It's basically in a state of suspended animation or living death. Uh, when suitable temperatures are felt, uh, the frog will begin to thaw, and this takes a day or two, but can be as few as a few, as little as a few hours. It's really thaw and go. So you might have a frozen frog firstly in the morning, and by the afternoon, it's hopping away. It's really incredible. So you're asking yourselves right now. So minus two to minus five, that's all well and good, but yesterday it was, or on Sunday it was like minus thirty. So where do they find that sort of temperature? So remember, the wood frog hibernates on the forest floor, so it might hibernate under dead leaves, under a log or something like that, but not below the frost line. Uh, so when there is a lot of snow on the ground, it actually insulates really well. So uh, up at the surface, it might be minus 30 or minus 40, but down actually at the, the ground level, it's considerably warmer than that. So it might be only maybe minus 5 and a couple centimeters below, like the leaf litter might be a little bit warmer still. It'll still be frozen, uh, but it won't be nearly as cold. So frogs are usually in good condition when they wake up, which is good news for them. Uh, instead of looking for, for food, wood frogs often travel, at, in, in many cases, over the snow to get to breeding ponds in, in the woods. Can people hear that? No, nope, maybe not. Ah, so we've got our forest filled with snow. It's a beautiful time of year to be out there. Um, you might be looking for wildlife and not seeing too, too, too many species. You might see their tracks. You might see their signs. A creature that I often wonder about when I'm deep out in the forest is how close am I to one without really knowing it? And uh, I call them the big sleeper. This is, uh, this is sometimes all that you see of this big sleeper in the wintertime is just a little, little hole in the snow. There might be frost around the edge of the, uh, the, this hole, and maybe there's a bit of a dark stain, and that's, that's from their breath. As they're, this, this warm-blooded animal is exhaling um, its, its breath, there's a little bit of water in that breath, and it's condensing and freezing around the edge of that, uh, that opening. Um, and that's a, uh, you know, a big animal that's concealed itself, uh, maybe under a fallen tree in a rocky crevice. Sometimes a hollow log. Uh, sometimes not too too much of a shelter. Uh, I will recommend that nobody try this at home. This is a former park biologist uh, that's looking in this in this crevice, uh, and what they're looking for is the black bear. So. Bears hibernate in a den, usually in the ground. It could be a hollow log or rocky crevice, but sometimes it's just on the ground covered with snow. This is usually an adult male bear that um, you know doesn't think too much of homemaking. They don't eat or drink during this time. They don't avoid any waste for up to six months. Their heart rate slows from 50 beats per minute down to 10 beats per minute, uh, and their body temperature remains fairly high. Despite their heartbeat, dropping quite a bit their body temperature stays pretty warm it doesn't fluctuate too too much unless they have to get up in a hurry and there's a couple of reasons why they might uh, although the bear's metabolism has decreased its body temperature has only dropped a few degrees so the energy savings it helps but it doesn't help too too much and interestingly for a really big animal that's comparable size to us that's not moving very much if we did that our mu muscles would atrophy and shrink at that time 
but despite staying still in the den for a really long time, their muscles don't atrophy at all. So to be able to do this, bears put on a lot of fat and they need to do this, uh, or, and to do this, they eat a lot of food. They end up eating nonstop in the fall if they can. That's the ideal situation for them. And they're going to be looking to eat about 20,000 calories a day, which is apparently over 35 Big Macs a day. Uh, and that's that's just for the fall season. That's about 10 times more calories than they would normally eat on an average summer day. Uh, now, hopefully they're not eating Big Macs directly because that means people are doing a bad job about storing their food. But they will go after things like beech nuts. So they'll climb up beech trees in the fall to eat the nuts up at the top. Um, this image here is depicting a, a beech tree where... Uh, the bears have broken off distant branches and brought them back to the center to sit there and munch on the on the le or on the uh, the nuts. Uh, and we can see all the leaves remaining on the trees. So it went up there and did that uh, maybe a few weeks before this picture was taken. Uh, while there were still leaves on the trees, it brought them back. All the the living branches lost their leaves, but the ones that were dead because the bear broke them off still have the leaves on. At the bottom right, I've got a picture of those little tiny beech nuts with their little uh, prickly cap on them. Uh, so you can imagine it would take a lot of these to fill up a bear and a lot of them to add up to 20,000 calories. So to survive the winter, bears put on a significant layer of fat, many inches thick. So I've got uh, a stack of slices of bread here just to show uh, how thick maybe a successful bear uh, would put on a fat. So a really thick layer of fat, many, many inches thick. Um, and this thick fat helps insulate the bear a little bit, but really what it's doing is it's supplying itself with, uh, like a meal replacement. Uh, it's going to be a source of energy, so it's not going to eat anything, but it's going to burn this fat or metabolically use this fat, uh, while it's in hibernation. It needs a huge amount of energy. And remember, this is a marathon. It could last five months. And in many cases, uh, that thick layer of fat is really, really important, especially to female bears, because they give birth during hibernation. Every other year, uh, a female bear will usually give birth in, in hibernation. They could have one to five cubs. Usually two or three is more normal. And, you know, to think that the, the mother bear is like fully unconscious during this time wouldn't be accurate. She's awake and, you know, she's, she's snoozing a lot, but she's caring for a bear cut or for her cubs. They're born, she cleans them, uh, she's nursing them uh, on her very, very rich milk. And that baby bear is born at about the size of a chipmunk, so pretty small. By the time they emerge from the den uh, a few months later, they're already about, let's say, this big. So maybe closer to the size of a, a really big groundhog by the time they emerge. They grow very quickly. So for the bear the bear in this den it's not just asleep or torpid like the groundhog it's still pretty with it and can arouse fully in just a few minutes so if you happen to see one of these things and, and i don't recommend doing this but if you you know peered in and maybe started shouting at the bear you know or something like that it might wake up and run away uh and it can do this in, with just a few minutes notice its body temperature isn't really uh that much lower than it is during the summertime so it's it's got full awareness and its, uh, its muscles are still in really good shape. So it could wake up and take off very quickly. And when bears emerge in the spring, they're quite thin and very, very hungry. Uh, in many cases, they lose up to 40% of their body weight over the winter time. So they might've put on about, you know, 40% of, uh, or add up to about 40% body fat. Uh, and when they wake up in the springtime, they don't have too, too much of that left. So they're plenty hungry. There's not always a lot of food for them first thing in the spring. Uh, so they end up eating a lot of grass. So they wake up, they're very, very hungry, and they find about the nutritionally poorest food that's available is grass. And th that's almost all that's available. So they eat lots of that. They eat tree buds, they eat ants. So if you imagine you know, being a very, very hungry bear flipping rocks and eating the ants that are underneath, uh, you have to eat a lot of ants to get full. So those bears that do wake up, and this mother bear here has cubs. Um, so the mother bear especially will continue to lose weight. Um, the, the cubs are putting on weight because they're nursing from mom. She's not necessarily getting a lot of food. 
Uh, so she definitely needs to make sure to find lots of food. So it's definitely time, time of year to put away bird feeders or pet food or anything like that to prevent attracting bears to your property. Uh, there's natural food out there for the bears. They'll find it, but uh, we don't really want to give them a free meal and we don't want to train them to come close to our houses. So to finish up here, it's tempting to think it might be nice to snooze away the winter like some of these animals, but it certainly isn't as easy as it might seem or as they might make it look. Entering hibernation as a response to environmental conditions like, like the cold, the day length, uh, lack of food, preparation for it can take up most of the animal's active year, especially in the case of the bear, uh, and they do some pretty incredible physiological feats, ones that we really can't do. Hibernation is tricky and safety is never assured, and there's no one-size-fits-all method for doing it, and it depends on many factors like body size, diet, the kind of animal, whether it's warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Um, it is a risky but necessary way to, to survive our climate for many species. Also, if any of you have cats, uh, this might look like a form of hibernation, but this cat definitely still wakes up in time for cat breakfast and cat dinner every day. Although I feel like many of us uh, might like to do this, I think being active and, and engaged in, in our, in our wintertime is maybe a really interesting way for us to spend the, the winter. But what about us? Um, just remember, hypothermia sets in at uh, just a couple degrees below normal. So at 35 degrees Celsius, uh, our body's usually at 37. Uh, so we don't do well by, by lowering our body temperature. We get dehydrated very, very quickly. Just Even just breathing out uh, water vapor, we can lose a lot of water. And we starve to death after about three weeks uh, and probably sooner it, when we have high calorie demand. So if we're shivering, being very active, or, um, or just trying to sit still at a very cold temperature, uh, we'll probably burn through our fat supply for pretty quickly. And if we sit still for a really long time, our muscles atrophy very quickly as well. So we're not well adapted to hibernation at all. So thanks for exploring how some of our neighbors survive the winter here by hibernating. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing many of these animals again uh, with the mild weather uh, coming in a couple of months. Uh, it'll be here before we know it. And, uh, you know, this is what, uh, what we have to look forward to and, you know, the near to distant future. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for having me. And if there are any questions, I'll be, be happy to take them for a bit. Thanks again. Okay, thank you so much. That was a fantastic uh, talk. We definitely have a few questions coming through. Uh, first one would be, can you recommend a moderate trail you like for winter snowshoeing close to the west gate of Algonquin Park? Mm. Um, yeah, we've got, a, we've got uh, some trails that are open for, for people to use for the winter time. Um, depends what, what you mean by moderate. And, and also, in many cases, the trails that are really well used in the park don't need snowshoes anymore because there's been so many people on them. Uh, if I was going to go out snowshoeing for the day, um, I would probably uh, go to one of the plowed parking lots. So we've got a list of those that you can pick up at the West Gate. Um, and uh, you can park your car there. And then you can go off basically anywhere uh, in the park uh, on snowshoes. Uh, we just ask that people stay off of the groomed ski trails. Uh, if I was going to pick somewhere near the nearish the west gate uh, I might park at the Peck Lake parking lot um, and you know you can only drive up a, a certain amount there uh, and then uh, go for a hike in that area uh, I would also go to the airfield at Mew Lake uh, so that's a great big open area um, excellent snowshoeing to be had there uh, okay I've got another question why were the antlers still on the bull, bull moose in winter all right, so I took that video, the very astute observation. So I took that video in December, um, probably four or five years ago. Uh, so the moose typically lose their antlers anytime between December and February. Uh, and it's not uncommon to see a moose still with antlers into February. Um, it's maybe not like the normal state. Uh, they usually lose them not too, too long after, um, after let's say, Christmas time. Um, but yeah, they can't have them on for, for a fair bit of winter. And, you know, they fall off. Um, 
let's say January, February, and they start growing again by March. So um, they're not without them for too, too long. A good observation. Um, I've got another question about porcupines. Um, how would you get a porcupine to move off a uh, cottage property? Or um, do you know? <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a really great question. Um, if it's trying to get into your buildings, um, you know, that, that's one thing you might want to talk to a pest control professional. If it's just on the property and it's chewing up your trees, um, yeah, that's, I, I don't really have any recommendation for, for trying to shoo it off. Um, you know, if it happens to like the trees in your property, it's probably there to eat them, and uh, which you might not be that keen on. So uh, no real suggestion on getting them to, to move along. Um, encourage a fisher to hang around. <laughs> uh, yes, that might help. Um, <laughs> and we have found a couple. I found porcupines are kind of easy-ish to find in the winter because you'll see the kind of tracks that they make looks like one big or a small animal snow plow has just yep. <laughs> <laughs> moved up to a tree um you had a question regarding beech trees um how does the decline of beech trees due to beech bark disease uh, affect bears ability to put on enough weight for winter hi hibernation so that's a really great question. So beech trees in our area are really declining, at least in health and probably in number in, into the near future uh, due to beech bark disease. There are other trees that do produce hard mast in our area as well. So beech trees are still producing reasonable crops um, periodically. So they don't do it every year and they never did. Um, but there are other trees that do produce uh, reasonable mass crops like uh, like red oak and white oak a little bit further further south of Huntsville. Um, it seems like bears are adapting to that uh, because they don't eat just one food source. They eat a variety of food sources. So they're still finding that. Uh, but that certainly is a concern for uh, for wildlife biologists. Like, what are the bears going to do if uh, one of these reliable food sources isn't as available anymore? Um in our part of Ontario, beech bark disease is fairly new, but there are other parts of Canada and Eastern North America where there's been beech bark disease for nearly a century and they still have black bears. So in uh, Nova Scotia and Maine and uh, in New York State, for example, uh, beech bark disease ripped through there, uh, let's say 70-ish years ago. Uh, and it's, it's killed off a lot of the beech trees there and it's left behind a lot of small trees that don't necessarily produce nuts. Um, and they still have be and they still have black bears uh, in, in in good numbers as well. So they've probably alternated food sources or or shifted uh, shifted part of their diet. But that is a, a very real thought for us here in Algonquin because we don't have a lot of red oak trees, but uh, we do have a fair number of beech trees. So we're keeping an eye on that, and we don't know how that's going to play out. Okay, uh, can you add a bit about beavers? What they do in the winter? Ah, the beavers. So beavers are active all winter, uh, but we just don't really see them. So sort of like the snapping turtle uh, that spends the winter underneath the ice, the beaver's world is largely underneath the ice and in the beaver hut. So imagine being confined to uh, a small um, house with your family that you're living, you know, elbow to elbow with, and it's, uh, it's warm. It's warm in there, which is good. Uh, it's probably fairly wet in there because the beavers go in and out of the water and into the house. Um, and I imagine that the air doesn't smell terribly fresh in there. So there's a small ventilation hole up at the top of the beaver house, the beaver lodge. Um, but the ventilation is not that great. The beavers will spend most of their time in the house and they will swim out of the bottom of the house. So they go from the air pocket into the water and they swim out to a food cache that's underneath the water uh, that they've uh, gathered over the fall. So they cut lots of vegetation, they pile it up um, in the water. They put the uh, worst stuff on top and the good stuff underneath. So as the ice freezes, they can get at the good stuff underneath. Um, and they go there and they chew a piece off uh, while they're underwater so they can seal off their cheeks so they can just use their incisors. Um, while they're underwater without taking on water. They chew that off, they bring it back into the house, they eat it, and then they bring the sticks back out and discard them underwater because there's only so much space in there. Uh, so that's generally how, how beavers spend the winter. 
uh, if you see a beaver out on land in the winter time, while there's still a lot of snow on the ground, you know something's not right with the with that particular beaver colony that maybe they've run out of food uh, or that they're running really short on food and they're going out on land to try to look for additional uh, vegetation to cut to bring back. Uh, and this makes them particularly vulnerable to predators like wolves. Okay, thanks. That's a uh, nice, nice quick dive into beavers. <laughs> uh, and would he, uh, actually I'll do this one first. Are otters similar to beavers in the way that they uh, handle the winter? Um, well, they both spend their time uh, in the water in the winter time. So otters uh, do not hibernate; they're active uh, year round. They don't winter in like an otter house, for example. They uh, they might shelter in some spots in like uh, undercut banks and things like that. Uh, but they don't they don't stay in like a beaver house or something like that. So otters uh, are kind of nomadic in the winter time. And really what's limiting them is access to open water. And they can hold their breath for a really, really long time. They can swim around underneath the ice, but they always have to go back to a spot with air to breathe. Um, so they might be able to hold their breath for a couple minutes, look for fish or other prey. So it could be tadpoles, fish, freshwater mussels, occasionally even snapping turtles. Um, but they've got to come back up to an air hole to breathe. There's recently been some thought that they are able to find pockets of air that accumulate underneath the ice. So you can imagine like a couple of air bubbles um, forming or staying in a, sort of a, a high spot in the ice. And they can maybe find these using their whiskers, feeling around at the surface of, of the ice. And they can find that and like inhale the air and then keep swimming. It sounds like a pretty risky strategy to me, but the otters, I think, know what they're doing. So um, yeah, very, very interesting animals. Sometimes they'll move a fair distance overland in the wintertime uh, where they might have um, exploited all of the available food or the available feeding areas in one water body where there's open water and they might have to leave or maybe that water body is freezing up very, very quickly. So they'll go and try to find another one. There's lots of reports of otters moving many kilometers over land to get to a new body of water in the wintertime. Okay. Um, and the last question, uh, would you, uh, someone who's very interested in learning about larger mammals um, and w some of the tracks that they make, and would you consider doing a presentation on identifying animal tracks in winter snow? Uh, Aaron, are you asking? This is another person <laughs> asking. Uh, so, and potentially I can mention that I've done some mammal tracking as well. Um, so that may be something we can uh, offer. Um, and I can maybe talk to Dave afterwards and see what your uh, experience I, with that is. I have done a few winter tracking presentations as well. Um, they're not like a hyper detailed presentation about like, oh, you need to, you know, look at these like micro details, but trying to organize um, tracks into main categories uh, and figure out a problem approximately what you're looking at and then you know building skill after that to distinguish between you know a martin and a fisher and a mink and an otter and all that stuff uh but looking at patterns of tracks and getting it down to like a you know fairly narrow group uh, based on the way the tracks were laid down yeah so i have done some uh, and i'm interested in doing others um, and I can also add that we tend to do, depending on the COVID situation, we do a nature quest in the winter regarding mammal tracking. Um, so I'll, I'll take a group out and, and we found about, I don't know, 14 species of mammals on one of our properties on one of the outings. So nice. That would be yeah. way more fun than a PowerPoint presentation over Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> it can get a little dry, I've found, mammal tracking. <laughs> Um, okay, well, I think that's all the questions. So thank you so much for uh, joining us again and offering your expertise. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it. Um, and I think everyone else seemed to do that as well. So thanks for, uh, thanks for giving us your time, David. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me again. And uh, I'll wish everybody a great winter. Yes. Have a great time, everyone. Great. Thank you. Take care. Stay warm.